Hello, everybody, and welcome to Kotaku Split Screen, Episode 6. I am Kirk Hamilton, one of your hosts, and I'm here with Jason Schreier. Hi, Kirk. Hi, Jason. You sound so excited. This is my How's first. This is my. This is my exciting time to to finally be the first person to talk on split screen. You sound so excited about it. Kirk Hamilton, pretend wannabe host of Kotaku Split Screen. One day, one day, I will become the true, the true Kotaku Split Screen host. Well, as as the host, you have to try to get me excited. Like when someone else is, when a guest is falling flat, you have to be the one who like pumps them up. So I'm gonna talk in a monotone voice, and you have to figure out how to get me excited about this podcast. It would help if I had a studio audience. I think I would get them to like chant your name a whole bunch, and Jason. you can't help. Like you have to get excited when you have a whole audience going, Jason, Jason. So pretend I did that maybe and would that make you excited? Can we get some audio effects in here? I know we don't we don't do any fancy audio <laughs> We can do it editing. in post. We can we can <laughs> do, do it in post. post. Just take care of it in post. I'll just so, figure out a, so, a way to do that. Kirk, I have I have a complaint. Okay. Uh, there are I know <laughs> I, I I like complaining about things. Today, uh we should have a regular feature called Jason's Complaint of the Day. <laughs> I feel um, like that's probably gonna be a regular feature even if we don't call it a regular feature. That's true. It'll just be me complaining every day. Uh my complaint today is that today uh a game comes out called Trails in the Sky, second chapter, and I've been waiting for this game for four and a half years since I finished playing the first one, which ends on a giant cliffhanger and like there's a whole long saga behind getting this game out the door and it comes out today and right now we are recording this on Thursday uh, I guess this will probably go live tomorrow Friday but we're recording this on Thursday as of right now it's 4 p.m. Eastern time and the PlayStation Store still has not updated with the game and to me that's bullshit like if you're <laughs> if a game is gonna come out and the release date is this day the PlayStation Store like should have it up on midnight of that day not like it be 4 p.m. and the game still is on there. Like that to me seems like something worth starting a hate campaign over. I think uh, yeah, I think this is for a petition, man. I think it's time Sony for a, like it's time for a gamers unite petition. I mean, isn't that ridiculous? Like, hey, I what if I pre-ordered this game? I spent my hard-earned cash on this game. I've been waiting for years and years to play this game, and then like release day hits, and I see people playing it on the computer because, of course, Steam has it up. But Sony can't get their shit together and like update their store by by the late I mean, afternoon. I don't know if it's bullshit, but I mean, I you know, I, Sony's store is always a little weird, right? I feel like there's always, like stuff is always up at weird times, or they don't quite know when things are going live, and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's nonsense. <laughs> what, what kind of excuse do you have in 2015? It's not like well, they're I mean, Nintendo. <laughs> well, you've they, like, used PSN, know. though. PSN is not, I mean, they're, it's not the most like flawless system in the world. <laughs> that's true. PSN has, has some issues. But like, I would think that like these mega billion dollar companies like in 2015 would have this down to a machine. I mean, you would think you would think that. And yet I feel like our regular day to day experience of these services regularly disproves that idea. All they do. I mean, these they're all fucked up in ways that don't make sense. You're like, come on, really? Like it's 2015. Yeah. Yeah. Especially Nintendo's system. Uh, so so. Nintendo. Well, we'll talk about Nintendo a little bit later, right? Because they had some some decent sized news this week. Yeah, some uh, some sort of boringly delivered, but still kind of cool news. Yeah, we can definitely get to that. <laughs> yeah, that was ridiculous. We should talk about how they delivered. It. But uh, so today we're going to talk about a few things. I think that we took a bunch of reader questions for this episode because we don't have any special guests. It's just. Uh, me and you, you and me, me. We, me I think we are we are the special guests. Special we are guests, our own Kirk Hamilton, Jason special Dryer. guests. <laughs> uh, so we took a bunch of reader questions. We're going to go through those, and uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit about what it's really like to work at the famous snack website Kotaku.com, a well-known Destiny fan site and occasional <laughs> snack review site. Destiny, or Kotaku. I almost called it what? Destiny. DestinyTaku.com. Destiny Taku. Snack Taku, Destiny Taku, TV Taku. Once in a while we cover video games. So uh, yeah, let's let's maybe start with that. So we're talking about this time of year, which is an exciting time of year at any video game website, because there's a lot of stuff happening. So yeah, Jason, football. maybe what what's your what 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 how does this type of year this time of year work for you? 
Well, basketball just started. The NBA just came back this week. Uh, and football is, like, well and going. Uh, the MLB World Series is going on. So I'm usually going to spend most of my day checking ESPN, um, maybe playing with my fantasy football lineup, uh, <laughs> right. figuring out what. Oh, oh, we're talking about Kotaku. Oh, right, right, right. Those Video are all games. games. <laughs> I mean, those are games. They Somehow, I mean, fantasy football is kind of a game. Fantasy basketball kind of a game. It's funny because, like, for a while, I remember in maybe it was August, September, October, like, at some point, I was like, hey, I really wish I had more games to play because uh, it felt like things were stagnant and, like, all I was playing was Destiny and, like, a few things were on my radar. And now, suddenly, because the video game industry has collectively decided that everything has to come out in the fall, uh, we have a million different things all coming out, which is challenging when you work for uh, a video game website. Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, we uh, I feel like there's an idea right that at Kotaku we just play video games all day when in reality obviously we don't. And I would say even if I played video games all day, like if that really was this job was just sitting there and playing games, it still would be impossible to play all of the things that I want to be playing right now. Um especially god, it's like and in the next couple of weeks, it's just very difficult to keep up. Um, there are a few sort of left field releases that came out just this last week. I'd say Divinity Original Sin Enhanced Edition is the one that it's like, oh my god, here's a really good but 60 plus hour long RPG right in the middle of everything else. At, like, yeah, it's it's definitely felt a little bit overwhelming. So that's that's, I'd say, a big challenge this time of year in general. Yeah, and uh, Trails in the Sky, of course, which actually, I mean, I guess it's nice of Sony to give us time to play other things by just not releasing Trails, like not <laughs> just never come out on. <laughs> um, I mean, that game is, and that game is probably long, right? Like, how long is the original Trails in the Sky? Yeah, the original, I mean, that took at least 40 hours to beat. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this one is supposedly double the size, so that'll be fun. It's, that's something that, you know, to to not just complain about having too many games to play, but that's something that I think really is an interesting challenge actually for working at Kotaku. It's something that um, we'll talk with our boss Steven about a lot where basically we look at, you know, we're a Gawker site. We look at the other Gawker sites that, you know, that we like and when they're doing stuff that we like, uh, like we, we look at Deadspin, which is a great site and the way they cover sports is so cool, but there's this huge difference, just this fundamental difference in what we cover in that the things that we cover take us so much time to fully experience. You can't just sit down and watch a game like you can watch a, you know, a football game or a baseball game and then kind of have stuff to write about it. Like for Assassin's Creed Syndicate, like I've been playing that game for a week and Stephen and I are starting to get stories out of it, but that game requires 20, 30 hours just to kind of uh, basically know it. So that's definitely something that's a unique challenge in covering video games, I would say. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that people don't realize about Kotaku, how it's like to in order to cover a game thoroughly and also make time for our destiny addictions, we have to just like <laughs> dedicate our lives. I mean, that's why you don't have a personal life, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it does. This time of year, I really do like get, I become kind of a hermit and I feel depressed about it. And there are times where I don't hang out with people in real life because I'm literally because I'm like playing video games by myself which isn't so bad. I mean, I think that a lot of times people play video games by themselves instead of going out socially, but it does get to you after a while when you just feel, or there's a fine line, I guess. Sometimes it's really cool. Sometimes it feels like, God, this is such a job, like you're doing it for your job and you just have to get through enough of this game to say something about it or make a video about it or write a tips post about it or something like that. And uh, that can definitely be kind of exhausting. So yeah, so people might not realize exactly what it is that we do every day. Uh, so, so I mean, t- maybe we should talk about, like, a day in the life of, of Kotaku. Sure, that'd be interesting. What's a day well, like in the life of Kotaku writers? Yeah, or at least, but, I mean, it's different for everybody, right? Each of our writers has a different focus, but we could talk about a day in the life of each of us. Yeah, what's a day in the life of Kirk Hamilton? Wake up, start playing Destiny, <laughs> occasionally check into Slack or chat room and see if anything's going on, go back to playing Destiny. You said it for me. I guess I don't have to say anything. <laughs> no, uh, so my day is usually, um, my shift right now goes from 10 to 7. I'm on the West Coast, so I get on. I usually start writing at about 8.30 in the morning or start looking for things. And um, What time like do you hour, wake up? Uh, like it's around 8 most days, 7.30 or 8. Mm-hmm. 7.30 if I like didn't stay up super late. And then later than that, if I did stay up super late the night before. But usually around 8. 
Um, basically, just wake up, make coffee, make breakfast, and get online and start looking at what's going on. It's kind of cool. So my deal is... I'm like the West Coast whatever. Like I'm the guy who comes on when West you guys Coast have already West Coast whatever. Kirk Hamilton Is that West your Coast official, whatever. Official official title. Yeah. So um I kind of come on and the day is already underway, right? Like the like morning video game news and press releases have already gone out. Um, East Coast stuff is already happening, so it's sort of my job to make sure there's nothing missing, make sure the site is looking okay. Uh, we have a big sheet that we just keep with our schedule for the day. Call, uh, we call it Sheet 16, and I definitely check that first thing and just see, okay, so where's everything going? Who's got what stories coming where? Who's working on what? Look in Slack. Kind of, it's a lot of catch up at first because the day is already happening um, because you East Coast guys are already going. So then I, you know, I usually write in the morning. Um, I don't. I like to write when I'm not on shift because it's uh, it's easier. There's usually so much going on like during the days. You know, people asking questions, needing help on stuff, looking for feedback on headlines and images. And when all you that. say you write in the morning, how do you decide what to write about? I think that's one of the things people always ask us is like, how do you set, how do you decide what stories to write on any given day? How do you uh, find your topics? It depends. Um, with me, it's usually the games that I'm playing because I write a lot about the games I'm playing. Um, so if I'm playing something, I'll usually have made a note of it the night before and said, oh, that was a cool thing that happened. I could definitely write that up. That's like there's something interesting there that illustrates like something what, about the when game. When was the last time you found a cool thing that you felt like, oh, I got to write that up on Kotaku? Uh, let's think. Oh, well, here's the thing I need to write up um, that I haven't yet, but this is a thing I just found is I really want to talk about the controller scheme in Divinity Original Sin uh, in the new version. Like, I think that's very interesting and like would be a good article for Kotaku. Just talking about how these guys have have made a CRPG with really, you know, mouse and keyboard and really weird controls work on a controller, and they really have. It's kind of amazing. And, uh, you know, it's like a, it's not just sort of let's talk about Divinity Original Sin, it's let's talk about the specific part of it. So noticing that and making a note of it, then in the morning I would, you know, not this morning, but I guess maybe tomorrow, I would get up and just sort of make some gifts and figure out the article structure make and try to get gifts. it done. Make some gifts. Get up and make some gifts, the Kotaku That's story. basically every morning. So yeah, and then just work through the afternoon. There's kind of a big shift that happens for me um, at around 3 or 4 p.m. my time, which is when all the East Coast people start going home because it's 6 o'clock and Luke Plunkett in Australia comes on and Luke brings his own whole, you know, he brings a great energy to Slack, but when Luke comes on, you always know, okay, Luke's here. And so it becomes kind of a different type of Kotaku. It's like Kotaku after hours. Uh, you guys are oh, still yeah. around Dim sometimes. Oh, yeah, Kotaku it is, after you know? hours. It's, it's like, Pour it's got a different, a, a different energy. There's Ladies and gentlemen, happening. Luke Plunkett is in the house. <laughs> Kotaku after hours. Um, so, you know, uh, that's sort of the shift. And then I go through till seven and usually stay on late and just leave it on and talk to Luke about HBO series and stuff. So that's me. How about you? What is the day in the life of Jason Shire like? Well, it's funny. So, so I am the, uh, the news editor at Kotaku, which means that, uh, I create the news. Um, so every morning I usually spend about an hour making things up to write, write about throughout the day. Um, that's, that's an important part of your day, I'm sure. Uh, no, well, so I'm in New York where our office is. You, you get to work from the comfort of your home, and you don't have to worry about commuting, but I have to take a subway every single day, which has its pros and cons. It's nice to get out of the house and not be trapped in one place all day, um, but it also takes a lot of time because that's like a solid hour and a half every single day, 45 minutes each way of commuting. So that's a thing. Um, but yeah, I come to the office, uh, check what's going on. It, it's funny, my job has changed a lot over the years just because the nature of how Kotaku covers things has changed. Like it used to be a lot of like the the people would get in and be like, oh, what's in our inbox? What press releases came out today? What is, uh, what's on our RSS feeds? But because we've stopped covering like a lot of that kind of game gaming non-news bullshit like oh look this developer <laughs> said this thing or like this random game got announced that nobody really cares about this, pu- or, this publisher has no plans to right, add this no feature, <laughs> add a feature. Or, this game has gone gold oh man those are the worst stories <laughs> halo That's 5 has gone gold you'll never believe it a video game <laughs> that that was supposed to come out this fall it's coming out this fall it's, it's been <laughs> finished imagine if, if like It'll, movie sites would all cover like, oh my god, the Steve Jobs movie. Final print. They finish editing it. I Holy feel shit. like we joke about that, but I bet there's some equivalent in movies where yeah, that totally probably. does happen. Like, probably. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, news has changed for us in a lot of ways. We do a lot more like original covering. So I do a lot of uh, just talking to people and sources and making phone calls, sending out emails, working on various stories. I have a weird, weird uh, tick. I don't know. When I was a kid, I used to always procrastinate until the last minute and like get stories done at the last possible minute for school and homework assignments and whatnot. So now, these days, at Kotaku, uh, whenever I'm working on, like, an investigative feature or, like, a long-form story, I wind up waiting until the last day, the day before I'm supposed to write it, like, and then pull an all-nighter or something like that, or, like, like wake up really early the next day and just crank things out. And that's, like, become the best, like, the where my best stuff actually comes from. <laughs> it's doing it that way, weirdly <laughs> enough. Like, when I do things in advance, they're not nearly as good as when I do them at the last minute. So sometimes I'll do that. Um, and uh, uh, Kotaku is, is an interesting place. We, we, uh, so what, what's, the, what's the office like? I mean, so you've commuted to the office, you're doing your thing, but you guys are in a new office. I haven't even seen it. What's that space like? You're sitting next to Steven, right? You're across from someone? Who, yeah, who's it's, sitting where? It's hard to describe. We have like a little pod. Um, it's me, Steven, used to be Tina, rest in peace, uh, Yannick, <laughs> uh. Evan, and then Patricia just moved to New York, so she'll be in the office soon. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have our own little, it's not really a pod. I don't know. It's hard to describe. There's like a big staircase in the middle of the office. And then you walk up the staircase and you get to a lounge. And then on the left and right of the lounge, it kind of breaks off into different segments, the office, where like there's a table and everyone sits around a table. So the way it's broken up is different sites have their own segments. And we have ours. Um, Kotaku has our segment. Uh Oh, as as we are recording this, Mirror's Edge was delayed. Sorry, Kirk. Mirror's Edge oh, got I'm, Mirror's Edge just got delayed. I'm I'm fine with them delaying it. I mean, I think you know, I'll whatever that that game probably if it needs extra time, it needs extra time. Um, let's see when when was it? Let's do some uh, live. So right now, I w- I would be like writing this up or blipping it or whatever. Oh, it was delayed to May 24th, 2016. When was well, it coming out originally? February? February. Was that the plan? Yeah. Um, so if I were on right now, uh, if, <laughs> if I were not recording a podcast right now, I would probably be writing this up. Although I guess it's not. Well, so one of the questions we always ask is, is this really worth a full headline story? Or is this something we can just blip as a one-liner and just direct people to go look at something else? I think this is a blip. Um, and yeah. This is that's how I'd present it, just like as a blip and like tweet it out. But that's one of the interesting questions we've been asking a lot recently at Kotaku is like, how often should we actually put a headline on something and make it into a whole big story with real, like like a real story versus something that's just a one-liner on the site? And a lot of the times, the newsy stuff that we would have done with full coverage in the past. Uh, like three, four years ago, is now turned into blips. Like, hey, this yeah, game was it, delayed. It's an interesting question, right? Like, in this case, there's kind of just one sentence. Like, right. you said, like, everyone listening to this podcast got the news from the right. one and sentence. That's you, you just mean. said it's delayed to May. Like, yeah. so that's where you're saying, okay, turning a whole post out of it. Like, Mirror's Edge has been delayed, right, is the headline. And you have a big picture of Faith. And right. then, like, you know, your lead is EA has announced that Mirror's Edge has been delayed to May. And then what's your what else is there? Like you yeah, put you in a, the most recent trailer or something like right. So that's kind of like an, an actually kind of an easy one. Like this that's a blip because you can just put up one sentence on the site that says, hey, guess what? Mirror's Edge has been delayed. Kind of a good way to go. Yeah, well, so the interesting thing about that is that uh, a lot of the other gaming sites, and I don't, I don't want to use this as an opportunity to trash our competitors. But oh, really? <laughs> what a lot of gaming sites do, and what Kotaku maybe did in the past. I'm like looking at my Twitter feed right now, and I see IGN tweet "Mirrors Edge Catalyst delayed," and then a link to their story, and that's the headline: "Mirrors Edge Catalyst delayed," which is like the type of thing where you have to click the story in order to see when it was actually delayed until, um, as opposed to just putting the information in the headline or like putting it on a blip on the site which is uh, a, a arguably a consumer unfriendly way or like a reader unfriendly way of handling it but uh, that's their prerogative to each their own. It's interesting, you know, like I think I think that like it's the kind of thing we used to do too. Um, there's always like a line between with that stuff. I actually do think that most 
gaming websites are moving more and more in this direction uh, mm -hmm. because other like there's just no you know it's so obvious that there's no reason to do it especially when ea and ubisoft and all these big publishers they have their own whole blog and their own whole media empire basically mm -hmm. like there's just like if you're obviously just trying to like you know to use in really easy information and like you know headline it and package it in that way it's just not really that useful and i think that everybody sort of acknowledges that so i actually think i see less of these sorts of stories now than i used to like pretty much everywhere yeah uh i don't know i i still feel like i'm seeing well i don't know maybe there are just fewer gaming sites but i still feel like I see, <laughs> they're all going out of business <laughs> yeah that's the problem i mean i still feel like i see that i still feel like i see the gone gold stories i feel like i see the like this developer says his game is going to be incredible uh type stories the stuff yeah there's still like, there's still some of that i guess um, um but so yeah i mean the other thing about doing that is that like like by not taking the time to pursue those kind of non-stories and like have our news people, we have a really good news team at Kotaku, and having our people who are more news-centric not waste too much time doing nonsense like stories that can be completed in one line like that, it frees us up to do more real stuff and like write original stories and break news and uh, try to find interesting parts of gaming culture that, that things gamers are doing that we find really interesting and that our readers find really interesting that aren't the type of bullshit that, that we might have covered in the past. Yeah, and also to obsess over headlines. Like also do obsess over headlines. Yeah, that's another thing I don't think people realize about Kotaku is how much time we spend like writing headlines and, and uh, believe it or not, trying to make them not too clickbaity, but also interesting enough that you would want to click them. It's you, a fine line, man. I, so I was on a panel about this at PAX where you were at that. About right? clickbait. I was, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so it was a panel specifically about clickbait and headlines, which I was like, yes, I will do a panel about that. Are you kidding? That's like the thing that I spend more time on every day than anything else except maybe Destiny. Um, and uh, it was interesting talking about like what what clickbait is, like how what a good headline is. So we spend a lot of time on that just for each story. Like sometimes it really will be, um, for some reason it's Nathan Grayson, God love him. His stories are always really hard to headline and he comes into Slack and he'll, you know, it's usually because he plays a lot of, you know, cool, weird games that the rest of us haven't played. And he'll say, well, I just played this game. This article is just about why this game is cool. And he'll pitch, you know, three or four different ideas. And we just spend forever. We, you know, usually come up with a good one, but just forever trying to come up with the best way to concisely articulate what's most interesting about the story without misleading people and without, you know, promising more than the story delivers. It's a, definitely a tightrope act or a high wire act. Yeah, and headlines are so interesting because there's so many ways they can go wrong, um, like and be taken out of context and be misleading and be annoying and like, like you lose so much goodwill from readers. I think when you are annoying and misleading and vague about headlines, like saying, like you won't believe what happens next. That whole, the mm -hmm. whole upworthy mm -hmm. thing. Um, people do. People think of Kotaku as clickbaity, and I think that's because they nobody really knows what clickbait actually means, and they misinterpret like uh, something that's interesting or grabby or like like something that draws you in was something that's actually clickbait and i think the big difference is that clickbait makes you like feel angry that you clicked on it it feels like it doesn't ju the headline doesn't justify what you're actually getting versus right. something that is grabby and draws you in and then you click it and read it and you're like oh wow well, this so <laughs> it, which which then makes it kind of understandable right i mean i my thing i think my definition or working definition is that the clickbait is about the contents of the article not actually about the headline like if the headline says the most amazing dishonored kill streak you've ever seen the article just needs to be the most amazing dishonored kill streak you've ever seen. And mm -hmm. if it is, then the headline's not clickbait, right? But if it isn't, if it's just some kind of cool shit in dishonored, but you gave it this hyperbolic headline, then if then people will say, well, that's such a clickbait headline. It's, I mean, that's maybe a like overly simplistic example, but that's how I see it. But then, I, I, I don't know. Like, I think also people just use clickbait as a way to say a thing I didn't like. Like, I really think that like <laughs> it's, because 
it means that sort of already. Like it means, oh, this, I didn't like this article. I think people just start to say, oh, you put forth this article, which means you by default wanted me to click it. I didn't like it, therefore it's clickbait. Like I think it's like a, it's like hipster, or it's like one of those, you know, those pejoratives that people use that could mean a lot of things, but just sort of means. I don't like your website, so yeah. I yeah, that's okay, it. so here's a good uh, example. Patricia, uh, a while ago, wrote this great piece called Fuck Pikachu, and it was uh, a piece about <laughs> how she hated Pikachu. And so people looked at that and called it clickbait, which is nonsense, because there's nothing clickbaity about that. No, right. It's You see a headline called Fuck Pikachu, you know exactly what you're going to get. Especially like with an image with a giant middle finger like pointing at <laughs> Pikachu, pointing, which was like yeah. what the top image on that article was. It was a very clear headline. It was not in any way clickbait. No. Yeah, so it's very clearly going to be a strong opinion about Pikachu. Right. It's an article a lot of people will click because, like, right. I love that headline and I would headline. read the hell out of that article. But it's definitely, yeah, not The clickbait. clickbait version of that would be, like, I hate the this Pokemon that, like, the you'll never believe which Pokemon I hate. Or, like, I yeah, hate this Pokemon. Yeah, that's, like, clickbaity, like, right? Yeah, that would be the more baity version. Or something that's, like, fuck Pikachu, and then it doesn't deliver on the premise because <laughs> The, the article really is actually about, about Meowth. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's about how much she loves Pikachu. Um, right, right. So it's interesting. And these are discussions we have all the time uh, at Kotaku about our stories. Um, there, there's a lot of interesting things. Like these days we're trying to find uh, the best ways to cover all the games that are coming out because we both want to have reviews and like have timely coverage for when a game comes out so we can tell readers, so we can tell you guys whether or not a game is worth your time. And also we want to be playing games that are coming out or out already because that's where the most interesting stuff comes from. Like right now, uh, uh, games like Assassin's Creed and Halo are still on our radar, even though they've come out already, because there's so much interesting stuff still going on in them that mm -hmm. we want to keep playing and writing about them. So it's it's going to be an interesting balance, especially when Fallout comes out and takes over all of our lives. Well, it's been and it's been I mean, it's been tricky for me the last month because like uh, we joke about Destiny a lot, but really covering that game has been a real challenge because there's so much new crap and they're introducing new stuff every week and it gets really hard where I'm like definitely past the point where I'm feeling just totally exhausted. Not because I've like run out of, well, kind of because I've run out of things to do, but there's just so much and it's always there and there's so many other things to play. So, you know, but then again, Trials of Osiris launches this weekend. We got to play that because, you know, like you said, with our post-release coverage, like we can have... You know, I'm very proud of our Destiny coverage. I think it's really good, but it requires us to play that game. So what do we do when Fallout 4 comes out, you know? like, And then it just is, it definitely is going to be a chaotic few weeks. So let's talk about Destiny real quick. Okay. Uh, I know that uh, this podcast doesn't talk about Destiny enough, so I think we have to talk about <laughs> it real quick. So uh, something that I think would be interesting to hear from Kirk Hamilton. Kirk, you wrote the definitive review on Destiny. I think anyone who pays attention to games would agree that back in 2014, September 2014, you wrote the review of Destiny, the one everyone was reading and talking about. Um, then you wrote pretty much the definitive review on Taken King. I don't think it made as much of a splash probably because Taken King wasn't as interesting because it was just good and that's all. <laughs> like right. you, there's, you said a lot of interesting things about it, but it wasn't as fascinating a story as the original Destiny was. But anyway, but that's all besides the point. The question for you that I'm curious about is how do you figure out how to critically dissect a game? And like when you're playing a game, what are the questions you ask in order to write a good review? Because we see so many reviews uh, on certain competitive sites, certain competitor sites that are like, just like kind of checklists of like here's what the gameplay is like here's what the story is like and like kind of written in this clunky like we're trying to review this as a product way and it doesn't really get at how a game makes you feel and like the interesting stories behind the game but when I read a Kirk Hamilton review I feel like I'm getting that that interesting uh, I'm worried that I'm blowing too much smoke up your ass and I need <laughs> no, to like feel take free. a step go back ahead, go ahead go ahead just say but nice things tell me yeah. about your process for reviewing okay. a game okay uh, that's cool I'll happily talk about that. Um, that's, a, that's a, I mean, I guess the main thing is when I review a game, I really immediately decide whether I'm going to be recommending it or not because we do those review boxes and I kind of just get that out of the way in my head. And I try to, I try to think about anything that can allow for like a, bro a bigger or broader insight into the game itself and how the game works, which that sounds like a kind of a big thing, I guess, but 
really it's actually about identifying moments or things that happen in the game as I'm playing that will that can stand in for the experience of the game itself. Like a lot of times I don't even identify those things until afterward when I'm writing and I think, okay, well I did that and this thing happened. Like take in the original Destiny review, it was all about the loot cave, right? And that it's funny because I think what made that review something people talked about was the fact that not a lot of people really had taken Destiny all that seriously yet. Um, It was a couple of weeks after it came out. There were some very perfunctory reviews of that game, if you remember. There were people who reviewed that game like a week after it came out. There were people who reviewed it two days after it came out. And it was was so weird, like, especially considering now this game that I've played almost like a thousand hours or something, you know, that, that you could possibly write anything that way. But no one knew at the time. Everyone just thought, okay, here's the new Bungie game. All right, we played through the single player. It's cool. No, I disagree. Seems right. even, at, even at the time, we were like, these are shitty reviews. These are like shallow, well, cursory yeah, looks at a I'm game. I'm cutting people a little slack, though, just because <laughs> I think nobody quite... You couldn't understand what Destiny was in those first, you know, t- the week or the first... I mean, Which I is why like, you shouldn't review it. Now, you know, it's like, right, right, of course. But, um, but so... But playing at that time, there were so many things about the game that like summed the game up. And I, I feel like actually that might be a crutch for me in reviews. I do that too much, or it's like a bad habit of basically saying, okay, this thing, this event, this boss, this fight, this encounter is also a stand-in as a metaphor for the game. And that's like the pin of my review. Because I do that a lot in my reviews. Like it, uh, like I'll look and the conclusion kind of circles back to this one thing and says that's the game in a nutshell. But I do think a lot of games summarize themselves a lot because games are systemic in that way. Like uh, most video games require you to repeat the same sort of thing over and over again. So when you get this one kind of perfect moment that captures all the different aspects of the game, it sort of does happen in games a lot. And it can be very useful for sort of articulating that the, you know that insight into the nature of the game. So, so the loot cave for Destiny was definitely that kind of a thing. So when you're when you're fig- when you're thinking, okay, I'm going to write this review of this game. Is that what you say to yourself? You say, what's this moment that it kind of encapsulates everything? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a little looser than that. But as I'm playing, I just te- I keep notes, which I think is really important because I forget everything as it's happening, and then I look back over my notes and think, oh yeah, that thing that happened. Um, I'm constantly capturing videos, so I always can go back and just watch some stuff. Um, which is useful. But yeah, I mean, it really, eventually when I come to review it, I think, all right, so what is it? What sticks out to me about this game? What was the thing that happened that, that summarizes what I liked or didn't like or what work, uh, or didn't like or what worked and what didn't work about this game? And then kind of start writing. And, you know, then usually, like you were talking about your procrastination thing, like there's a point 75% of the way into the review where something clicks or something doesn't work. I cut a thing, I move a thing, and I realize, okay, awesome, I've got it. Like I've got the sort of the through line and the metaphor and the explanation and the like mechanical summary and I can fit them all together in a way that makes sense. And it doesn't always happen, but usually it, it gets there with enough work. Interesting. Very interesting. This yeah, is the Craig Hamilton is, experience. Reviewing games is weird. It's hard. It's fun. Um, I haven't I want to review more games. I haven't reviewed that many games lately. Um, but uh, but yeah I'll be doing some doing some this fall, which will be cool. Which games are you reviewing this fall? Um, let's see. I'm going to do, I think I'm going to do Just Cause 3, okay. which will be an interesting game to review. Um, I'd love to review Divinity. I'm not sure I'll have time to do a proper review of that one. That'd be fine. Uh, You're but, not yeah. doing Fall, right, Patricia's doing Fallout. Yeah, which will be really cool. But that, our review will probably be late, because I don't think we're getting a copy. And it's, yeah, and that game is a billion years long, so that'll That's be... That's true. That'll, that'll be, be interesting. interesting. I took I took a week off at the end of November, uh... Just to play video games. <laughs> oh, really? Nice. That's funny that we like have to take a vacation to do that. But yeah, I figured that with Fallout and like all the and Trails and like Divinity and all these other giant massive RPGs that I want to get through, I figured it it'd be nice to have a week where I can just like spend at least half of it sp- staying home and doing nothing, thinking about nothing, and just playing games and zoning out. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know you. You'll be in Slack various times telling people things and making sure we're reporting stories but yeah i think that will be nice for you are you saying that i'm a workaholic (laughs) no i would never suggest something like that that is just that is slanderous and i would never i would never do that you saying that i'm ocd i mean you're kind of a workaholic (laughs) we all are that's how it goes yeah yeah, whatever. It's funny. I, I, I report often on crunch in the video game industry while working <laughs> like at yeah. 10 p.m. on a weekday. But I but I don't know. I feel like it's way different when you're like doing yeah. it because you want to as opposed to working like 
crazy hours because you have to. Because oh yeah, it's it's very different and like right exactly and doing it from home and just sort of I mean being online and checking on stories and kind of half paying attention and you know playing some game for work is very different than having to like crunch out some you know code on some e3 demo for three weeks or something right it's, it's right sounds miserable yeah uh, the um, parallel is kind of funny though the like that game journalists also all never stop working basically uh well at least at kotaku we don't <laughs> <laughs> I, I keep trying to give other game journalists credit man lots of people work hard that's true there are some some hard-working people at uh, a lot of uh gaming sites that whose work i enjoy um there is there is a churn though. I mean, it does feel like a lot of not a lot of people last in this field. People tend to move on to PR jobs and like leave game journalism for various reasons. I don't think I think that we are very lucky because not uh, not a lot of other outlets give writers the flexibility and like the ability to kind of do good work without being interfered with um, that we have at Kotaku. We're also very lucky in that we don't have to worry about like publishers, game publishers, <laughs> and access at all. Like I've heard stories about other outlets, and I definitely won't name them, but I've heard stories about people at other outlets who like might get a scoop and like hear about a game that they want to report on before the publisher announces it, but their bosses won't let them because that outlet has to rely on publisher access in order to uh, in order <laughs> to stay in business. Man. Yeah, that would be rough. That would definitely be like a rough, a rough reality to have to deal with. Um, so we should talk about Nintendo a little bit. Yeah, I'm into it. Let's talk about Nintendo. This, this week, Nintendo <laughs> kind of fumbled their announcement of their first mobile game. They put on a an investors conference, and the entire Western world only found out about this through a Wall Street Journal live blog. Very weird. It was really weird, right? I mean, I felt really, yeah. I mean, I don't, so I'm not, you follow Nintendo much more closely than I do, mostly because it's your job, but I was, I, I was in Slack. This was late at night uh, for you and kind of right at the end of my shift yesterday, and I'm watching this stuff and Brian Ashcraft is in translating stuff from Japan and Luke is helping cover it and the whole thing was so weird it was just this weird kind of really clinical press conference I guess and I'm seeing kind of vines on on Twitter and that kind of thing and this weird Wall Street Journal live blog yeah it was a strange event yeah well the press conference I mean there was no press it wasn't a press conference it was an investors meeting and right right the Wall which Street I guess Journal is why it there. didn't look exciting at all it the, was just some guy the, giving a PowerPoint right uh, the Wall Street Journal was the only outlet there covering it in English, so that was the only way to get all the news until Nintendo officially announced it a few hours later. So we were kind of filtering everything through this guy's like live blog, and the live blog was confusing. And like you would quote analysts without giving proper context, and like people thought he would say, he was saying one thing when he really wasn't saying another thing. And then at some point he said the presentation was over, and everyone was like, "What?" Because they hadn't announced their <laughs> mobile game yet. And then right afterwards they announced this mobile game. Uh, what's it called? Me, me, Tomo, me, me, Tomo, yeah, something like that. That sounds right. Um, and it sounds like Tomodachi Life, like on your phone with me's which I'm sure will be neat and like cook people if it's done well and it's Nintendo so you know it's going to be done well but uh, the better question is what is our fantasy mobile Nintendo game that's the question we're dealing with right now, have right? you thought about it at all I thought about it some. Um, I think you probably thought about it more since it was initially your question so maybe you go first and um, I will con- I will respond to your to your fantasy Nintendo mobile game and say all the reasons I think it would be bad. You'll respond to mine and tell me. Okay, so you don't want to create anything. You just want to no, criticize. No, or I'll come up with one. We'll typical, see, but I want to know what you think. Kirk. Only, yeah. only criticizing, never creating. That's, oh, that's so me in a nutshell. <laughs> um, well, have you played uh, Box Boy? Yes. So that's the type of game that Nintendo kind of... Nintendo has kind of snuck all these brilliant games that are totally under the radar and, like, these little bite-sized awesome things for, like, 3DS, like Box Boy and Picross and uh, uh, Pushmo, games like that, which I think are only really appreciated by the hardcore Nintendo fans who know about them. But those are the types of games that are brilliant and, and small and, like, little bursts of fun and really well-designed and polished in Nintendo style that I think think would be perfect on 
uh, when trying to reach a broader audience. And like everyone always talks about like, oh, Mario, Zelda, new Nintendo IPs, that's how you reach people. But I think Nintendo could find a lot of success if they make some of those small, awesome, bite-sized, box boy-like games and design them from the ground up for touch controls, put them out there, sell them for five bucks or whatever. Um, the, whatever they make is going to get attention, so I'm not sure they have to worry about marketing these mobile games um, because whenever Nintendo releases a mobile game, it's going to be on the front page of every, every news outlet. Uh, so I don't think that... Mario and Zelda, they might be draws, but I don't think they're going to be necessary to for them to sell something and get something in the top of the iTunes store. Um, so really, any I, I think they should make something original and small and unique and innovative. I okay, I, I actually don't agree or I don't disagree with any of that. so um so that's that's good. Yeah, I think that any of those games, I mean, I, we we talk about this a lot where we'll play like Box Boy is a really good game. Um, the way that game teaches you how to play and the way it teaches its mechanics and the new ideas it has, it's very simple, but really cool. And a lot of their games, like Pushmo is that kind of a game too. And playing those games on 3DS, it used to be, you know, Nintendo's, Nintendo's whole thing was that the quality was so low on the average iOS game. And then on 3DS, you know if you're getting a game, it's going to probably be good. And that was sort of the thing setting the 3DS <laughs> Which apart. Which isn't true anymore. <clears throat> well, no, right. But like, it, it, if, it's, if it's a Nintendo-made game, it's probably... You know. I don't know. I just gave a no to Triforce Heroes. Okay, but it's a safer bet than buying a random thing on the iOS. Chart. Yes, yes. But then so, again, but the 3DS has its own eShop with full of shovelware and like garbage. Right, right. So, right, true. They, I mean, they're like it's very hypocritical that they had that that uh, uh, point of view before, and now suddenly they're each. Well, it was marketing, right? Trash. Like it was like it was it was all marketing. Sure. And, yeah. And that so for them to take that same idea, if they can release those games, I think you're I think you're definitely right. If there's just a really good Nintendo game, like a Box Boy, say it's just Box Boy, mm-hmm. um, but you know something else. And they release it on iOS. Everyone will be talking about it. It'll be great. People will be. Everyone will be playing it and like tweeting about it. There will be tons of buzz because it's a Nintendo game. It'll, yes. You know, if it's a good Nintendo game, it'll just be good. And uh, they'll probably make a lot of money on it too, and keep doing that. Which I am way. I'm more hopeful that they'll do that than that they'll you know port over old old Zelda games or whatever or old Mario games. Yeah, that doesn't feel necessary, that getting Mario and Zelda games, unless it's something totally new, which I would totally be yeah. down for, a new type of Mario game. I don't think Zelda is that big a draw. I think people overestimate how much selling power mm-hmm. Zelda actually has. I yeah. don't think that, like, I think uh, most Zelda games tend to under undersell as awesome as they are. I love the Zelda games, but... Uh, People don't love them as much as say Mario. Well, and or know them even. I mean, they're they're just yeah. nowhere near as iconic. I mean, Mario is like Mickey Mouse. Zelda is like what? What's the what's the Disney character that that like Link and Zelda are like? They're just they're lesser well known. You can't even characters. think of them. They're like uh, I don't know Aladdin. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they're like Aladdin. <laughs> I, you know, but like like what was the Jeopardy question? The person got wrong, right? Like because they well he got it right. <laughs> Let's. You got it right. He got robbed. He but, did um, get robbed. He said Zelda instead of The Legend of Zelda, so he didn't get it wrong. Right, right, right. True. But um, I, I think you're right that it would. I mean, there will be some Mario shit, right? Like some Mario Paint kind of thing, or like you know any of those like Mario Verse games where it's all the characters like Mario Kart where they're all doing stuff. There will mm-hmm. be something on mobile like that, I would imagine, and mm-hmm. it'll probably be fun. Uh, you know, Tamadochi life is really fun. Like people really like that, right? What did you just say, Tamadochi life? Wait, is yeah. It, what did I call it? Is it a Toma Tomodachi life? Tomodachi. Get life. your okay. get your Japanese names right, Kurt. Come on. Well, I think I'm I'm probably mixing it up with a what kind of Tamagotchi, which is sort of. <laughs> we got a gaijin over here. We got a <laughs> yeah, got well, a I'm dirty gaijin myself. over here. Hey, we have a lot of reader questions to get through. We do. We should probably get on this. And we actually got one in while the podcast was happening. Oh, we're going to have a live? This is like a live Q&A. Yeah, live. live. (laughs) Um, So actually, let's start with that one. Kenneth. You okay. sent this in just at time, just on time. We sent it in actually like right around the time we started recording. Um, 
Kenneth says, my question to you guys is, do you guys like any games that aren't considered very popular or are just considered straight up bad in the public's opinion? If so, what are they? The reason I ask is because I just finished The Order 1886, your favorite game. And hmm. to tell you the truth, it's one of my favorite games this year. Uh... While generally not considered straight up bad, it certainly is considered usually flawed. So Kenneth wants to know, do you like any games that aren't considered very popular or even considered straight up bad? Uh, Kirk, can you think of any? Hmm. Hmm. That's a tough question. I feel like anytime I like a game, I like it for the things that I think that it does well. So it's sort of hard like to say, yeah, okay, maybe people don't like this, but I think it's good for these reasons, so then I think it's a good game. Mm-hmm. I think, I mean, The Order is a funny one. I've actually gone back and forth with a few of my friends about this. There are other people who like that game, too. Um, so what, what's the reader's name? Kenneth. Kenneth. Kenneth, you're not alone. Um, there are other people who like it. I really, I really, obviously really didn't like that game. Um, but I could see liking it. It's the kind of game I could see somebody getting into. So I understand that. Um, I think that the most famous, quote, bad, unquote, game that I've liked that uh, is one that a lot of critics like is Far Cry 2 where it's a game that has a lot of obvious problems. I think there are people who go a long way to kind of excuse some of those obvious problems and say, oh, they were on purpose. The responding guard posts, you know, they're not, they're meant to be like rhetoric about how war never ends or something. And you're like, no, dude, like they just couldn't get it to work. So, you know, it just doesn't. So acknowledging the problems of that game, I think is an important part actually of liking it. So that's my main thing with liking games that people criticize for things is that, it's it's fine to do that. You know, there's nothing wrong with you if you like a game that somebody else says is like unequivocal garbage. The key is to just acknowledge where the game has problems and to then figure out what you like about it if you like something. So that's, I guess, generally how I approach that sort of game. Mm-hmm. I don't know. What about you? Do you like any games that people just hate? I don't know. I guess JRPGs. Just J- just JRPGs in general. Just in general. I could kind of see that, though. Like, I feel like every time Steven is critical of JRPGs and says he just can't get with them because they're all the same and they all star, you know, kids who have no emotional intelligence and the whole thing is all very immature. Like, do you, when you play JRPGs, are you aware of that stuff or do you just not care? Um, I, well, I don't think that's true. <laughs> that's the thing. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, like, maybe if you're, pl- all you're playing is, like, Tales games, and that's how you think. But, like, a lot of JRPGs are a lot more sophisticated than people give them credit for. Um, but I don't know. That's not a real answer. I, I think I-, I tend to <laughs> hate on games that a lot of people love more than I like games a lot of people hate. Because if a game is generally hated, I usually won't even bother taking the time to play it just because there's so many friggin' games to play. Um, mm-hmm. But something like Xenoblade is a good example of a game that everyone loved, and I was like, wow, this is not good. Um, but uh, but I don't want to get lots of angry letters. Please don't send us. <laughs> well, I guess you can send all angry letters in support of Xenoblade to split screen at Kotaku.com. Um, but yeah, that game is trash. It's like talk about whiny like characters with no emotional intelligence <laughs> and like just grindy side quests and like MMO style gameplay without all the fun of an MMO because it was single player. But anyway, that game is garbage, uh, and I will fight anyone who disagrees. Um, let's move on to the next question. We don't get <laughs> so through all we've got, we, we now know a game that you don't like. Yeah, I don't know. Question. I couldn't think of any off the top of my head that I like. No, that's I was fine. That's about, fine. I was thinking about older games because there are a lot of older games that I think we look back on fondly, even though they were really trash, like stuff like Battletoads and like uh, uh, DuckTales. And like, like a lot of those games are like we look at them and say, oh, my God, they're so much fun. But they're so buggy and had so many problems. Yeah, I think DuckTales was definitely a case of that, right? When that remastered version came out and everyone kind of said, yeah. oh, like, like DuckTales oh, wasn't right. actually that fun. Exactly. <laughs> it just had a really good theme song. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was like, it made people nostalgic, but like that's all they had. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of those games were like the NES and, and uh, really NES mostly were like games that we just kind of grew up playing and loved because they became formative parts of our life rather than uh, actual good games. Anyway, let's right. move on. Okay, yeah, let's get through these. We got we got a bunch of reader questions to do. So let's Alex get going. asks, "How do you both feel about the double RNG drops of Hard Mode King's Fall?" This is a Destiny question. Of course, um, it is. That's the rate in Destiny. To me, it's way too frustrating to get to, to work hard to get a three ten drop. I had fun farming for exotics to infuse up to three ten. Kirk, tell us about the dark side of you in raids. That's the part I'm most interesting in talking about. Interested in talking about because. Uh, 
Kirk, you have a dark side. I think that this whole narrative is kind of a joke, and I just wanted to point out that everyone is sort of kidding when they say that, because I'm actually very nice during raids, and that's the joke. So are I don't you? actually think that I have that are much you? of a dark Are we side. kidding? Are we kidding? When I think you guys are kidding. I think that that's why it's funny, is because oh, I'm yes. generally very helpful right. and positive in raids. I mean, I, everyone gets frustrated, right? Like, especially during hard mode, you die at a stupid time, and you get mad. I okay, wait, never wait. I think I have to give us people, I think I have to give some context here. Okay, okay. So Kirk and I raid together and we have a a, a decent sized group of people who we always raid with. We have we draw from the same pool of people, um, our friends mm-hmm. in the press and elsewhere. And uh Kirk Kirk can get a little testy when we're not doing well and like when someone is doing something wrong and we're frustrated because the way these raids work in Destiny is that if one person fucks up then it can just waste everyone's time for a long time and like nobody wants to be sitting there for half an hour like like wasting our nights because one person can't get something right or like keeps dying or like keeps doing risky things or whatever um, and Kirk's way of dealing with this is to often say in a, in a kind tone of voice sometimes, a stern but kind tone of voice, uh, guys, we have, to, we have to do this. We have to stop dying. We have to not run into Golgoroth's pit while he hasn't drawn the gaze <laughs> of someone yet or he, he isn't looking at someone yet. We have to not do this. We have to not jump off the platforms while we're fighting Oryx. And <laughs> it's become a running joke among our, our friends, our Destiny buddies. It's funny. So I have to tell you that the experience of having this become a running joke has actually been very interesting because I didn't know that was a thing that I actually did. I f- almost feel like by us defining it as a running joke here, we're making it into more of a thing than it is maybe, but because I still don't <laughs> believe, like I still don't believe that this is a thing I do. Of like we'll be playing and the tricky thing is I like to give, like I like to kind of keep everyone on track and like give pointers and if the the only real pointer a lot of the times in these things is don't die like that's basically <laughs> right like and so then i wound up saying that and now i'm really self-conscious about it like i'll i try not to say it but there really are still just times where we're playing and the only thing people have to do is basically not fuck up and die and i guess the 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 my takeaway is you just don't have to say that because that goes without saying, right? So just don't say <laughs> right, anything. Right, exactly. Like, That's like everybody part. knows not to die. Right, right, right. Um, It's like, but yeah, it's not, of course. I mean, it really feel... isn't a dark side. Like, I don't ever, like, get angry and yell at people. I try to be... It actually is, I think, fascinating how raids and trials of Osiris is the same way work with blame. I think that blame is, like, a very dangerous and kind of thing that can really fuck up a team. And I try very, very hard to not blame ever and that's actually something i very actively do like if somebody dies to always say you know it's it's cool like if it's a new player or someone we don't know or someone who's not as good to be like hey man it happens it's fine because it does happen we've all been the guy who fucked up and blew the run for everybody and like to not kind of blame it but then there are also times where you have to figure out if someone's doing something wrong like you say hey is your like character spec for agility right now is that maybe why you're dying all the time (laughs) like you kind of have to start asking those questions because there's if a guy just keeps dying you you do kind of have to figure out why that's happening it's funny uh, in Trials of Osiris I feel like there's a lot more sympathy because it's a lot more difficult and like you can't really blame someone if they just get outgunned or like they're trying to do a one versus two fight Trials of Osiris yeah. by the way is the PvP tournament that happens on weekends and it's kind of an elimination match where three people fight three other people and uh, if you die you're permanently dead and the goal uh, well unless someone revives you if you die you're dead unless someone revives you and then the goal is to take out the entire enemy team of three before your team of three dies but anyway that's much it's much harder to do that well than it is in the raid like oftentimes in the raid it's like come on like you should be able to do this without dying right right there isn't the kind of x factor of another team and whatever they're doing like you know like Golgoroth does the same thing every single time. That's the whole point. So. Right. And yeah. it's it can be frustrating when it feels like someone is just being careless and like dying for stupid reasons um, as opposed to – well, so the first part of Alex's question is interesting because the RNG thing is really I, – I agree with you, Alex, that it's very frustrating that uh, the the – this new Destiny endgame is all based on randomly generated light levels. And, like, every time you get a piece of equipment, it can range from from super low to super high and be useless or useful. And it's it's become very frustrating in a way that I think Bungie should have known to avoid by now. It's funny. Like, I feel like they're... 
uh, this like every time Bungie enters new uncharted territory, that's where they start making the fuck ups. And every time they're doing something they did last year, they're doing it better. That's sort of been my experience so far with the Taken King. Like they did the basic loot system better, way better. Like getting up to 300 and the way blues work and infusion is all a huge improvement over last year. No question about it. But this new stuff, now that we're kind of into the post-300 light zone, we're, so we're like kind of in the end game, it's much harder to get gear that gets up there. And then, yeah, you have these raid drops where basically, yeah, this is going to be, I guess, just lost on r- listeners who don't play Destiny, but basically, like, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of, a, of an easy way to explain this, because we don't need to go on a whole Destiny thing. But it's just possible to get even, like, the top-level raid stuff, you can still get it and have it be basically useless to you. It can be 311 light or 310 light on a hard mode drop, and you can just say, well, okay, fuck me. Well, like, the guy right next to you got the exact same thing, but it's 320 or 318, yeah, because it's totally random. So there's there's still that feeling of being, like, of being screwed over. And it can be exciting because it can be cool when you get a 320 drop, but I think they need to adjust it a little bit for our current light and for our current gear, at least. Yeah, we should write about this. Why haven't we written anything about this? Let's let's jot this down for later. Yeah, I mean, I think there's an article in like in a lot of these in a lot of this stuff. I think we're still getting our heads around it. I mean, to go back to the thing we talked about earlier. Hard mode just launched. Yeah. Hard mode just launched. Trials is this weekend, and we don't know how loot's going to work with that. I'm right. I'm guessing it's going to be a lot of 320 stuff. I'm oh yeah, that's if you a good make point. it to Mercury, you'll get a yeah. 320 primary. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, there's there's going to be more to know. But yeah, there's it, it'll be an interesting thing to talk about once we know how the loot system works. Um, okay, let's move on. Let's get through let's all these questions. Going. So uh, Cutlass Stallion asks, I noticed the pro wrestling pro wrestling gets a story once in a while on Kotaku. Have you ever considered giving it a full sub blog that covers WWE, TNA, Lucha? underground the japanese promotions etc this is like <laughs> i can't answer this question this is uh a steven Tintilla question i mean we i i have I, we can't answer whether we've considered a sub blog but the no. sub blogs in general not are for cool. wrestling yeah probably not we don't cover it enough we have i mean we're like we gotta i think we're all still working on making sure we have the best video game coverage before we yeah. worry about as much as we joke about this being a snack website <laughs> or a destiny website well but it's it's funny like how that works you know where we've got nathan grayson who knows a whole ton about ufc and we've got steven totillo who knows a whole lot about wwe and that if we have these people on staff and they can just write something cool and a lot of readers write it or a lot of readers like it that's cool but for a whole dedicated like the sub site thing like we have a sub site for cosplay and a sub site for the best we haven't launched a new one in a while those are still those still feel like an experiment to me anyway like yeah. those like we're still figuring out how they work whether they work at all we've had a few that we did and then kind of closed so i think launching a new one right now especially for a non gaming thing is probably Probably not going to happen, but Mm. we'll keep running those stories, though. Uh, All right, you want to read the next one? Yeah, okay, so the next one is from Andrew. He says, I'm a college student considering writing for a game journalism site. Are there any resources that would be beneficial when researching potential articles or how to gather information for said articles? Well, most Hmm. game sites just (laughs) copy what's on Kotaku, so you can do that. (laughs) Okay, but like, what what are the resources that someone should use if they want to be in the know about what's going on in video games? Uh, social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, NeoGaf, uh, Kodaku dot com. I don't know. That's kind of a strange question. Resources when researching potential articles. It depends what kind of subjects you're hitting. I mean, if you're if you're planning on writing about like the latest press release, then you just use press releases. If you're planning on writing about the psychology of video games, then you would go to uh, the APA and look up some research journals. I don't know. That's kind of a vague question. Yeah, I mean, I think there are like there are not enough resources for that sort of thing. Actually, like Moby Games is a kind of a good resource for finding out who worked on what game, but also it feels very sporadically updated and inaccurate to me. Like, it's there's no IMDB of video games because that yeah. actually would be a really great resource. But, but how often do people need to do, like, look up who worked on what game for it can be video not, I mean, games, it's, say. I think it's something that critics in particular don't do enough is, like, is look at who worked on which game and actually understand those lineages. Like, a lot of times when I talk to people who work in development and who have been in it for a long time, They'll be able to tell me, oh yeah, that guy, he was the, you know, creative director on this game, and then he moved to design direction, and then started, went over to this studio, and I'm like, wow, that's really cool that, 
you know, the more I can learn those, the better. So it would be awesome if they were, if they were really, if Moby Games was really, really together or there was something like that. Hmm. Um, for now, I'd say Moby Games is your best option for that kind of thing. Moby Games, all the video games made by the recording artist Moby. Moby, <laughs> all of Moby's, oh, did Moby make a game? I feel like Moby made an iPhone game or did something. Did he call it Moby Games? <laughs> Hopefully Moby he did. Game. That's, the, that's the name Moby of his games. label, yeah. Uh, Quenlu okay. asks, what genre or genres do you generally not care for? And have there been any exceptions? I like hearing stories of people getting out of their comfort zones. Um, I can go first. I sure. uh, do not care for shooters <laughs> until this this one game came along, this one <laughs> sci-fi MMO shooter type game that took over my life for a very long time. Um, but seriously, I didn't remember when I first picked up Destiny. I was like, oh, I'll play for this. I'll play this for half yeah, an hour. Yeah, it's funny. I remember thinking that I, hate I was shooters. like, yeah, I was like, Jason is, is not going to be into this, but he can try it, I guess. Yeah, so to this day, that's still the only shooter that, that I really enjoy. Um, I can't think of any other first-person shooter. Like, I played Wolfenstein this year, or Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein. I, or I played that last year, even. Uh, and I did not like it that much. I thought it was, like, fine. It was, like, whatever. Uh, what about you, Kirk? What's your, what genre do you not care for? Um, I mean, I would say that the that for a while for me, it was JRPGs, actually. Um, I uh, didn't play them growing up because I didn't really have those game consoles. I just had PC, and there weren't really any JRPGs on PC, or at least that I knew you're of. Really, um, you're really hurting my feelings right now. Well, that was true, but that's no longer true. But I did get out of my comfort zone um, with... I had played a few before Final Fantasy VII, but Final Fantasy VII, playing that game with Lee Alexander and talking to her about it was really cool because I was You want to explain like, what that means? Yeah, so we so Lee uh, is a, a great writer um, and friend of mine, and this was, I guess, in like 2011 when I was games editor at Pace Magazine. And she pitched this idea or we just came up with this idea when we were talking of she loves Final Fantasy 7 I had never played Final Fantasy 7 the idea was I'll play the game and we'll do a letter series talking about it where she re she had just replayed it and I was going to play it again and it wound up turning into like I played that game man like I played the whole game at like 60 70 hours I got a gold chocobo I did the whole thing and I never would have done that without kind of forcing myself out of that comfort zone. I would have played maybe six hours and then said, okay, I, you know, gone and played something else. So having that, like pushing myself and having her pushing me to play it kind of got me to a point where I said, okay, I get the full JRPG experience now. And since then I've played a lot of games um, all the but way through. But you still haven't played more Sea Gun 2. It's true, I haven't. Um, but, you know, that'll that'll happen. I have the capacity now to play an entire JRPG. So so that was, the, that was my... Uh, that was my sort of coming, coming to JRPGs and a little bit late, but figuring out that I actually liked them. So, uh, one more question we have today. Uh, Space Gar Coast to Coast says, recently I saw a post where someone was talking about those problematic review scores, you know, universally disposed, but an outlet despised, maybe, he means, but an outlet mm -hmm. gives it a nine. What are some games you found yourselves having opinions on that really didn't match the crowd? It's funny, uh, I remember uh, uh, when Aliens Colonial Marines came out, EGM <laughs> gave it a nine or 9.5 or something. I remember that, and it was the weirdest review, too. Yeah. I, I, I still don't quite understand what happened there. Very weird. It was like... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it was written really strangely. It was like yeah, he kept strange. complimenting things that were clearly broken. Yeah, it was just like I felt like I was going crazy reading that, having played the game and just being like, I just don't get it at all. Like a lot of times when a review comes out that I don't agree with, I, I read it and at least maybe I can see where the person's coming from on some stuff. But with that game, it was such a turd that I played it and just reading this guy raving about it, it was just very odd. But Well, but that wasn't us. So the question is the question... What are some games you guys yeah, find really yourselves having the opinions same. on that didn't match the crowd? It's That's a, a similar, similar question idea. to the one that uh, that Kenneth asked before. Um, but uh, yeah, I, are, think, I mean, are there any games that like you think about that like you really liked and everyone hated? Um, the, I like. Sorry, really. I gave a good review liked. to Hitman Absolution. That was one that I reviewed and I liked it and said, "Yeah, this is a cool game." And then there were reviews that were really unkind to that game. Uh -huh. And I remember reading them and feeling a little like, wow, really? Like, I, I really like that game. 
and kind of reading the reviews. But it was the kind of thing where I, I, I saw where reviewers were coming from uh, in the complaints, especially like as you know, compared to past Hitman games. I think I kind of have reconciled the things that I like about that game with the things about it that maybe don't work. But it was a time where I kind of felt, oh, I'm sort of on the, I'm, I'm kind of the odd man out on this one. Mm. Um, I remember Steven being that way on Assassin's Creed 3, where he really liked Assassin's Creed 3, and everyone else in the world hated it, or a lot of people did, and especially me and Luke on staff, and it was a kind of enjoyable point of tension. It kind of still is, even. <laughs> like We'll still talk about that game and kind of bag on it, and he'll still defend it, and it's sort of funny. Yeah, it's still an ongoing an ongoing in joke. Um, yeah. So for to those of you who are listening to Kotaku Split Screen, you get to hear all about our our in jokes, our uh, our process, our our whole our whole uh, uh, existence at Kotaku in a nutshell, summed up by this podcast. Um, yeah, that, this has been our behind the scenes our behind the scenes episode. So just a reminder for everyone, if you uh, would like to send us a question to be considered for a future episode, you can email splitscreen at kotaku.com. You can uh, email any of us, uh, send suggestions, questions, advice, uh, puppy pictures, whatever you want. And (laughs) please uh, make sure you subscribe if you haven't already, and leave us a nice review. We got some nice reviews on iTunes last time that, that made me happy. So thank you to those of you who left us reviews. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for taking the time. Um, and uh, Kirk, any final thoughts before we wrap up for today? Uh, no, that'll do it. i got to go so I can go try to get anywhere in all these video games. So. Video games. Yeah. Gotta 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 leave a podcast so we can write about some video games and play yeah. some video games. All right, this has been the Kotaku behind the scenes episode of Kotaku Split Screen, episode six. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.